This is a recording for the Cuphat Project. My name is Matthew O'Brien. Today is the 30th of August 2023 and I have here with me uh, Jerry Cassidy. Thank you very much Jerry. Can you confirm for the recorder that you're happy to take part in the project? Oh I'm willing to take part if I can be of any help at all. That's great and if you wouldn't mind would you just spell your name for the recorder? My name is Jerry is J-E-R-R-Y and the surname is Cassidy, C-A-S-S-I-D-Y. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, could you tell me maybe, uh, just starting off a bit, your kind of early life, maybe when and where you were born and where did you grow up? Okay, I was born in Kiltegan, County Wicklow. Kiltegan is about 20 miles from here. My father was a guard and he was stationed in Kiltegan. But when I was four years old, in 1941, he was transferred to Shillelagh. And I had to come with him, of course. And I've lived in Shillelagh ever since, though I'd worked 12 years in England and I was in the army for two years in Ireland and I've been away a bit, but this is my home. Main Street, Shillelagh. And what are maybe some of your earliest memories of, of growing up, maybe in, you know, Kiltegan and well, then here? Well, I do indeed have vague recollections of Kiltegan. Remember, I was only four years of age, leaving. And I do remember, I was, I've always been interested in bird life. And I, I do actually remember my mother bringing me up to feed us the swans which were in the grounds of Kiltegan Castle and uh, on a, a pond up there and I remember going down some lane where we'd be out visiting some old lady and I'd be looking for birds and nests etc et so I'd always interested in that and I actually remember people digging holes there, the ESB must have been arriving then, though I, I, I don't think it would have been in uh, as early as 1941. But those are basically my recoll recollections of Kiltegan. And did you go to school in Kiltegan? No, actually I was only four years of age oh. when I left. I, I didn't go to school till like some years after I arrived in Chilela. And I remember arriving here and going through the house. And it was just walk in one door and walk out the other. And I remember tripping across a little rail or something on this, but that's a long time ago. <laughs> but yes, I grew up in Chilela after, after that. And I went to school in Chilela. But there's not much I can tell you about those times. But I do remember that uh, there wouldn't have been any cars or traffic on the road at that time. No cars, there was the war years. I think there, I think there were two cars in Chilena. But, um, and uh, the main road from Chilena to Tinahili, to Tuller, to Carnew, that one would be tarred, but the others were dirt roads, the one up to Colatin, the one up to Church Road, they were all dirt roads at that time. And uh, I've, uh, very, the nearest church, I'm Catholic, I was brought up as Catholic, so the nearest Catholic church was three miles away, and there were two of them, three, one was Kilquigan and the other was Tamakaw, but Kilquigan, even though it's three miles away, it's in a different diocese. So we went to Tomacock, which is three miles, and that's where we'd walk to Mass in those days. And uh, one recollection I do have, and, I, and I'll never forget it, and this was probably around the 1950s actually. I was walking to Tomacock Mass, and I don't know why I was going to the church that day with my mother or whoever, because uh, it couldn't have been a Sunday because people were walking. But along the way, 
there was a man sitting on a boulder, or maybe the side of the road, breaking stones with a mallet. And he had a sack across his back to keep him warm or whatever. And that always stood out in my mind. And those stones had to be broken very small because they were doing their roads or whatever with them. And that always stood out in my mind. Now, in those times, when we'd be coming from school or anywhere else, if you met a, a clergyman of either religion or a guard or a school teacher, you'd salute them or other people. And I never thought that as being subservient. I thought of it just mannerly. But uh, I often thought afterwards we were saluting them or, or out of respect, I suppose. And I often thought afterwards that that man breaking the stones on the side of the road probably deserved more resp respect than some of those people we were saluting. Those are memories of that thing now. And would you have had an interest in sport when you were younger as well? I, I played hurling, but I wasn't on a team. Uh, I was on crutches for a year because I had plaster on my a plaster on one of my legs. There was a bone bent or something like that, and I was on crutches. But it didn't hamper me. I used to go faster than the others because we put the leg to the ground when I shouldn't be putting the leg to the ground. And then I'd be told off for getting the plaster wet and to plus the powers or whatever it was. It'd have to be redone again. But. Uh, Uh, and after that, the footballs at that time would have been too heavy for for me to be playing with 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 the bad foot. But we used to play hurling, and we'd be hurling. I was never on team because we didn't have enough for hurlers here to have a team actually. But we'd be hurling, even in, into dark. You'd get the sound of the ball coming along to clear out the way, but. No, I think we were very keen on hurling, strangely enough, in this part of Wicklow. A few of us, anyway. And we had some interest in cricket for some reason. We used to listen to it on, on the radio. And there'd be cricket matches up at Cool Latin, I'd go up and see them. But I wouldn't understand the game at that time. I didn't appreciate how wonderful a game it is. It's a game you have to play to appreciate it. And so sport was important to the community then when you were... Oh, I'd say it was. It was mostly Gaelic football. And, uh, and the Protestants would be playing the, the, uh, the cricket. And when you were growing up as well, what kind of things did you do? Like, you mentioned obviously the hurling, but did you... And you mentioned your interest in birds as well. Yeah, oh, well, I was you? always interested in birds, but that was a lone thing. No, I wouldn't be bird watching with anybody else. Mm. And that carried on through all of my life. But we'd have little gangs, and I don't mean gangs like you'd have nowadays. It was strictly cowboys and Indians. But we'd have to make our own catapults or pop guns or whatever. You'd have to make you. You wouldn't have any guns or any. You, you, you had virtually no ties of any kind. And what was social and community life like there in the area when you were growing up? Well, I think for most people, it was just the pubs. And of course, in the hall down there, there were things like whist drives and concerts and uh, if. Uh, these travelling shows would come from time to time. And and then the travelling film show that they'd come. And usually the film would break down. When you go down sitting in the in the hall, you'd be sitting on firms, so you wouldn't have comfortable seats or anything. And if it was a series to be watched this bit this week and that bit next week, next week it might be missing when the time was coming. <laughs> And do you remember seeing any memorable movies or films? 
No, be kind of. I suppose my name is Cassidy. Hop along, Cassidy would be would be a, a good one with Gabby Ears and those. But there's none from that era that stand out in my mind. You know, you could see Laurel and Hardy and things like that. But uh, I don't know. You mentioned your father was a guard. Um, what kind of work do people from you know, Shalala do when you were... When you the were most of the people here in Shalala worked on Colatin Estate. Um, everyone in the village here would have, that have been working in Colatin Estate. Now, my father was a policeman, so it's ironical. He had been interned by the... by the, by the English in Ballykindler camp. And it's ironical that he ended up a garda on an English landlord's estate. But there was never any problem. And the Fitzwilliams, as the landlords go, the Fitzwilliams were good landlords, so there weren't any. And even the time of the troubles and all, there was little or no trouble in this area. I wasn't here at the time, obviously, but there was little or no trouble here. There was. Frank Brooke was, was involved later on, and it was in general there was no trouble that I'm aware the barracks was burned down the same as every other barracks was in fact that's how my father was maybe interned up because he was in, involved in, in when Bally train barracks was taken over in Northern Ireland Monaghan but anyway that's not about Shalala maybe if you could tell me a little bit more about Culloden and the significance of Culloden to areas like Shalala Oh, Colatin meant everything to Shalala at that time. Everybody had some kind of employment in Colatin, and, and all the houses were owned by Colatin, both here and in Carnew and in Tinehealy. So we, at that time, would have rented our house from Colatin. But, um, and you'd say, and we used to watch when to go hunting. They'd meet down here at the uh, Avalon Hotel, which is down there. And they'd have their drinks there before they go out and to go off on the horses. Fox hunting, of course. And as they always met down there on Stephen's Day, or Boxing Day, as they would have called it. And we'd go out to see them. But I, I like most of the children, would be on the side of the fox. Didn't, we didn't uh, like uh, the idea of a pack of fox, a pack of dogs chasing after a little fox. And and I think uh, it was Oscar Wilde had a right there the, when he said about the, the, the un, what was I said, about chasing the unedibles. <laughs> and what about Calatin in the present day? Do you think it still has the same historical significance that it once did? No, it's, it's there's no connection with Fitzwilliams to Colatin anymore. Um, I would have remembered the eight hour of Fitzwilliams. I remember him on the horse coming down and the hunt and all that. He was killed in it in a plane crash with Kathleen Kennedy. So that's another story we can go into later on down that bit of the road. But so uh, no, I, I and the the thing about that time is there were no telephones, no television, no radio. So you had to make up your own sport. And I think we're better off in some ways without some of those things. They're overused or abused nowadays. And do you have any particular connection to Colatin? I know your father worked there for time. No, I had no connection whatsoever to Colatin. But I was always interested in the history of Colatin, obviously. And, um, and then I became a member of Colatin Golf Course. And uh, because 
of my interest in the history, etc. One day, the president at that time, Eddie O'Brien, another O'Brien, this will be about 1988 or 9, he knocked on my door and asked would I look after Coolatton House, a caretake for Coolatton House, which only meant opening gates or open windows and things, letting in there. And I said, I thought for about five seconds, and I said, so long as there's no payment involved, I do. And he, and he said, oh, I'm sure we could manage that. And he often joked about that afterwards. But I enjoyed looking after Cool Latin House, and it went much further than just opening windows and things afterwards. I did a lot of tours of Cool Latin House, so I'd learned a lot about the Fitzwilliams, obviously, bringing people around. And and because the Fitzwilliams were never involved in slavery or anything like that, it, it was okay to bring them around. And did you have a particular, do you have a particularly, um, uh, or a favourite even, um, kind of uh, part of the history of Culloden or a particular part of the grounds of the estate that you like best? Well, I'd spend a lot of time rambling around in the woods because I'm into birds and all, and uh, especially Tom Finnow Wood, which is st still in use over here now. But you see, all all that, the Culloden had 91,700 acres of land over that in its heyday. But by the time I arrived in Shalala, that was down to about 5,000 acres, something around that. Because this wind act had come out in 1902 or four, where the landlords were encouraged to give their land to the tenants, to sell their land to the tenants. So now the tenants, instead of paying the rent to Coolatton, they were paying it to the government every week until they became owners of the land. And that, that happened around 1902 or three. And Frank Brooke was the, um, the manager, the estate agent at that time, and he he organised that very well because it it all all went off very smoothly. It happened in a few months to take donkey's years to do it nowadays. But he organised that very well. He got involved in other things, no doubt, which we which which weren't as popular around here. But he was, in that respect, a good agent. He lived up in our Dean house here, in, above the village. That was the estate agent's house. But um, anyway, it was down to about 5,000 acres then, which is still a big estate. So, where do we go from there? Tell me a little more about Tom the Fin Oak, um, maybe from a kind of a nature perspective. Well, Tom the Finn Oak is a very ancient oak wood, a natural wood, and it's supposed to self-generate. But anyway, when it when the estate was sold, was uh, a Tasha or some crowd got hold of of uh, Tom the Finn Oak wood. So we could all walk in it nowadays, you know, you, you, before... Well, I, as children, you were never banned from walking through any place. So you, as long as you didn't have dogs and guns, you, you, you could go through the estate. They, they never bothered us. In fact, we had the freedom of the whole area. And, and as children, it's totally different than nowadays. As children, you could go out in the morning, go out playing, and the parents wouldn't want to see it after dark at night. And they weren't worried about you either. It's different nowadays, and some of us, in my case, would make sure to stay out till after that. Otherwise, you'd be cut to go over and weed the plots or saw timber. It's the timber we use here, saw timber. But uh, that was our our childhood. I mean, <laughs> we we'd keep out of sight as far as, as long as possible because you'd be out over weeding the plots where the houses are over there now. There were plots belong to. 
people in the village here and we had gardens at the back of our houses or it was that or sawn timber and to, the sawn to timber was very difficult because you had a bad old cross cuts or saws with nuts in the timber and all it was hard work and you'd avoid it at all any, as far as you could but as I say, you had the freedom, you could go through the state, nobody bother you if you weren't doing any harm. But we'd still make sure to keep out of the keep out of the way if we saw the the manager of the estate or someone out there or the steward or some of those. We'd keep well out of, out of the way. But and and then when Tom um uh, it's a public wood for the public now to walk through so I do a lot of my exercise there because of the bird life there and in fact when the woodpecker great spotted woodpecker first arrived in Ireland in, in around 2006 you will you will read about the, the, this was a, a recolonization which I think is a lot of rubbish and I'll tell you why the evidence they use that the great spot of woodpecker nested here before. They got two sets of bones in the cave down in Clare. Now, obviously the woodpecker was here, but that's no proof that they bred here. They used to come in winter time anyway, and they never they didn't nest in caves, or they wouldn't be in caves. But an animal obviously brought in the bones. Maybe the bird had been cut by a hawk or something. But I'm amazed that scientists using that as proof that the great spotted woodpecker bred here before. They say then because of the because all the woods were felled and all that the deforestation or whatever they call it that that's why the woodpeckers here. But I, the woodpeckers I, I don't think they need forests we see nowadays they're gone so common now they nest anywhere. So I don't believe that one. Or there's Dick Coombs who was over the woodpecker thing at the moment. He doesn't accept it either. But people will still come up with that's evidence. But is it evidence that the Romans were here? If I dig my garden and there's a Roman kind there? No. And speaking of birds, what kind of other birds would you see in Tom and Oak that were of interest to you? Or Oh yeah, well... First of all, the woodpecker first arrived here in 2006 and someone told me there was a woodpecker over there and I didn't want to believe him. I said, who told him? And it was an English tourist. That said. So then I believed it because Irish woodpeckers, Irish people wouldn't know what a, a woodpecker sounded like rain else. So I went over and there the woodpecker was and I got photographs of it in 2006. And they didn't breed there until... 2009 and there was one nest there in 2009 the following year the, the youngster died in the nest because the male went missing but ever since that they have bred there and this year we had the most nests in its six nests all bred successfully and now they're even coming to my garden now here in the village here um, and would that have changed maybe from when you were younger? I mean, oh, there were no woodpeckers when I was younger. But even with other other birds, would you have seen other oh, birds? Oh, birds, other birds would be way more common than they are now. So we'd have corn crakes here. You can hear them from the village here. And now they're almost extinct in Ireland. You go out in the winter time, and the field will be covered with, with, with birds lapwing and thrushes of different types, the northern. They're no longer there. And I feed wild birds now and all. And okay, there's some birds have arrived. Uh, the collar dove arrived some years ago. The, and we have, we'd have little egrets now. And also there's a number of predators that have been reintroduced, like the kite and maybe the buzzard and they're very common now but I don't think they're a help to the other birds <laughs> we can't have it every way I suppose um, when you were younger would you have had a favourite bird when you were growing up or even now do you, do you still have a favourite bird it's, it's 
difficult to have a favourite board. One of my favourite boards would be the little cold tit because it'll come to your hand and and after a, a little bit of encouragement and it'll take away a nut and bury it. It'll keep coming back and take away nuts and, and bury it for for future. But the other the other the great tit or long tail tit or the be or the or the blue tit, they they don't take away nuts and hide them. There's only the little cold tit that does that. They eat them. But I, I I don't want to go down the borderline. We'd be here all day. Um, well, I'm just telling you that birds were much more common then. Things like cuckoos and and water hens or moor hens, they were all common then. They're almost non-existent now. Why do you think that might be? I think it's the, it's the change in farming, the cutting the grass early now for silage, the pollution of the the rivers and the land with the chemicals they use, sprays to kill and killing insects. Insects are scarcer. There's a number of reasons. The ditches, the hedges are all cut down nowadays. There's a number of reasons for it, and I, and it's it's only going to get worse. Moving away from that and maybe back into kind of community life here in Shalala, um, were there ever any kind of uh, events or local celebrations that were held maybe on a yearly basis? Well, there was the the pint to pint. Horse race, and that was held every year. It was by uh, Colleton Estate, of course. And the field for it and the, and the winning post was down where the Curry Foods factory is now. And the horses, the race used to start up near the churches and go down across fields and across the river and to finish up there. And uh, I used to, we used to go there and it's the first time when you see things like apples, oranges and ripe bananas that the, the, the people down from, ladies down from Dublin would be selling. But uh, that, that took place every year. When did that start? When did it start now? I can't say when it started. So it's just, when when it finished, not, you pardon? Think? When do you think it finished? When did it finish? It probably finished when the when the eight Earl was killed in the plane crash, probably around that time, 1948. And they still had them, the Shalala Hunt, still had them up to a few years ago, a different, slightly different course, but still had them. And were there any other community events, maybe more localised in the village or in... Only the football, I would say. Because the cricket, the, the, the Catholics wouldn't be involved in that. And if, if we want to know the, and the thing was ridiculous that time. You were banned from if you were Gaelic, you were banned from playing these other games anyway, which was stupid. Even as a child, it looks seems stupid to me. But that's the way it was, and it didn't encourage for. And then, uh, you see, there were two divides in my young days. There was a religious divide and class divide. The religious divide was Catholics and Protestants. And I'm, I, I'm a Catholic, but I blame the Catholic Church in my time for it. Before that, it would be the Protestant Church if you go back to the penal laws times. And they were, they were ridiculous restrictions. But then when you had when we were going to school and the Protestants going to one school and us going to another school that didn't help for communities but when the fifth earl and the sixth earl were in power they wanted all children going to the same school which was a great which if pity it didn't happen throughout all of Ireland but that's what they wanted and then there was a Protestant minister up in Carnew Henry Moore and he wanted a Protestant school for Protestant children, which I don't blame. But uh, 
Fitzwilliam wouldn't give him the land for the school. And it may have been a personality thing between Fitzwilliam and his Henry Moore. Henry Moore was renting rooms in Carnew Castle, which was Fitzwilliam's at that time. So Fitzwilliam wouldn't give him land. And he gave land for Catholic churches to be built on and all that. He, as religion went, Fitzwilliam wasn't biased one way or the other. So Henry Moore, because he didn't get permission to build his school, he built it in the Protestant graveyard in Carnew, and it's still there in the Protestant graveyard, you can see it. And when he was leaving eventually, Fitzwilliam tried to, to stop that too, but he couldn't do anything about it. And this would be the sixth hour of Fitzwilliam. And when Henry Moore was leaving, he looked for compensation for paper that he put up on walls in the castle or something. And I was told if Fitzwilliam had told him he could take the paper with him, but he didn't compensate him for it. But that might have been a personality thing more than a religious thing. But Fitzwilliam had on the committee, he would have a Catholic priest on it and Protestants on it as well. But I can understand the Protestants wanting a Protestant church for, so they could be reading the Bible or whatever. But uh, this idea of separate schools is never a good idea, in my opinion. And within Chilela then, are there any interesting um, or historic buildings outside of Calatin, say in, even in the village? Oh, should we can go in all Golatin the village? They're all built by Golatin and the Carnew and the Neely. Um, is the old courthouse, the station house, isn't there as well? The station house? Yeah, well, that was 1865 or something, the railway was built. I travelled on that train once. And I, tra I travelled from Ockram to Shalala and I um, with my s sister, my father, and I can't remember how I got there or anything else. And I, what we were doing there, we I needed to could see. I remember him kicking the doors in, in Ockram to try to get into the station for the train must have been due or something. And we got on the train to Shalala. I remember that. And of course, uh, when I was in the school down in Shalala, you'd see the engines chunting up and down every day because of across the road from the railway line. But anyway, that was taken down. And even in the broader kind of area around Shalala and, and the Wicklow Mountains and, uh, as well, um, are you kind of familiar with any with the ancient sites? Um, ancient sites? We would have gone to the ring forts and things, but... Uh, be hard to place where they are now. Not too far from here, up, up three miles up the road there. But uh, yeah, I was always a, a, a bit interested in history. But I'm not a historian. I wouldn't be be big into Irish history, ancient Irish history. Uh, I I know too much about the the war times but not enough about the past. And you see, because they say area was was owned by the O'Burns at one time, and nearly everyone around here still, there's loads of O'Burns. And when I bring tours through Colatin House, which I was doing later on, yet people question, saying this land used to be theirs or something like that. But I, I always then wonder, how did the O'Burns get the land? They were from awfully. So I, they, they're the strongest armies that got the land in those times when I was there. But when I was, I don't want to be going into the the um, and House thing now, but when I was bringing tours there, and one week I could have uh, children from a Protestant school, and the next week maybe children from... And I enjoyed bringing children. There's teachers would be with me. I enjoyed bringing children to the house because they would ask questions that then... Adults should be embarrassed to ask. They, they, they think they should know it already. Uh, so I'm, I enjoy bringing children. But one, the first thing 
I said to any class of children, I sat them down and I said, in, in bygone times, if you owned a lot of land or your parents owned a lot of land, you would probably have to change your religion to hold on to it, depending on whether it was a Catholic or a Protestant on the throne in England. And one lot was as bad or as good as the other lot. I tried to get that into the children because at my time it would seem that all oh, the Protestants are in charge, but no, it, 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 it was the same I find the Catholics were there, there's no difference in it. And yes, they'd have like, quite a fun with children. I remember Sean, one of the children was from the Protestant school, where the dumb waiter, the dumb waiter is a, is a place that there's ropes and things used to haul up the food. And the child asked me, was there ever anybody hanged here? <laughs> oh, I said, I said no. And he talked for a few more seconds then. Well, was there ever anyone shot here? <laughs> Children like that kind of thing. <laughs> but I had to say no. <laughs> Disappoint them. <laughs> and then uh, I would joke with the, with the ladies in Trunk Colatin House that a lady it was no use to the, to the if if you own Colatin House and it's ninety one thousand acres or whatever it was, you wanted a son for an heir, and I used to joke to the ladies that they they'd be no good. I did, they knew I was joking, of course, but at the same time it was correct. So, and it's the first child, the first male that would inherit the land. So one child asked me, and he said, he stumped me for for ten seconds. What if there were twins? He said. And of course, I'm a twin myself, but it stumped me for a few seconds. And that child happened to be a twin, but of course we know that that one of them would, there had to be one and two anyway. And are you aware of any? stories of folklore or a kind of myth that might exist either in Calatin or in the town of Finno Woods or indeed in the surrounding area? Uh, I've heard of tales about Calatin House of people seen and not seen and all that but I, I don't know. I, I looked after it for, for, for years for Calatin Golf Club and I'd be in there on my own. I would hear strange noises in places, but there's probably always a reason for these. I thought I heard furniture being moved about and all that. I don't know. And uh, there was a room up there that was supposed to be haunted. I don't know, because they say when somebody was was caretaking the house, when the, when the house was kind of closed down at this time, and he'd have an Alsatian dog, but there was one dog, this one room this dog would not go into. So I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't get talking to the person. See, I brought some clergymen through the, the house at one time. And they actually said if there was any spirit in that house, it would be down in this other room, a different room altogether. And somebody had told me one time that they'd seen somebody looking out that window, etc. A lot of these things can be in the mind. I never saw anything worse than myself in there. Um, and to kind of just talk about maybe um, kind of place and identity again, how much would you consider yourself to be from, say, the Wicklow Mountains? Oh, I'd almost consider myself to be a Wicklow person. I was in London for 12 years and I was in the in the Irish Army for two years. I'd, when I left school, I went into the Irish Army, to the Curra for two years, and I just want to tell you about one incident in the Curra. I don't want to go through all the, the stuff in the Curra. This was 1954 I went, I joined the Army. And, and even in Kildare, I had a brother, he was in another barracks, there was a seven barracks I think in the car he was in another barracks but um, 
even in the, the quarry, you might as well be on the planet Mars because you wouldn't have any contact with your parents in Chile or anything other than writing letters. But anyway, in 1954, there was a car racing in the Curra. This was in August 1954. And I was a recruit there. I was still in McDonough Barracks. It must be nearly at the end of my recruit time because I went in in April. You do six months training. And uh, we were brought, um, I prayed it out, I suppose, to... Uh, to control the crowds, use as marshals. There were, the Cora is flat plains and the road where the car racing was going down, going down the middle of it. So there was a rope a bit inside it and we were to stand in front of those ropes, keep that crowd behind, which was difficult enough to keep, to keep, to tell them to keep back. But anyway, one car coming down went out of control and the driver was a man by the name of Quinn. He was from Derry. And he was in one of those open race cars. And he mowed in through us. And the soldier who was next to me in guard was killed. And there was some pedestrian. I swear I was within inches of that car hitting me. It was out of control. It had come in on the, on the, on the grass. And... There was another person killed and some people injured and the driver was killed and he was actually strangled by the rope. The rope went around his neck uh, because it was, I told you it was an open car. And you can read up about that now but I was the soldier next to John O'Reilly was the man and he was from the same billet as I was from uh, in McDonough Barracks. And there was no such thing as counselling at that time. No counselling. I don't think we needed it either. But anyway, I suppose the counselling was a few of us had to train for a different type of uh, parade. It was for the slow march and the different change in the fun over the grave and all that. We, drove, we went down to Wexford and the Lurries to do that. 1954, August. You can check it out. That's incredible. Um, and you were in the army for two years, is that right? I was in the army for two years. And I left the army and after two years, applied for work, but nobody would even answer you in those days. You could, you'd be worn out writing letters, but they wouldn't even bother to answer you. And I even tried to get on the buses. But anyway, in 57, they were recruiting for London Transport in Dublin and that's where I ended up in London Transport. I'll give you one incident in, in London Transport as well. I don't want to go into My route was mainly through, through the West End of London, through uh, Piccadilly Circus, Green Park, Hyde Park, Kings Road and that. We do that trip th three times a day from Finsbury Park up to Clapham Junction and beyond. But in 1963, again, it was June, I think, 1963, pulled up this night, it was stopped beside Piccadilly Circus, and these two, two men got on and went upstairs, and there was virtually nobody on the bus at that time. So when I went up, I could, I recognised who was on it, and I'm no good at recognising people. It was Cassius Clay, he was over to fight Henry Cooper. And he was fighting Henry Cooper the next night. And I recognised him because I'd seen him on television the previous night. So he was in the back seat with, I think it was his brother, up on the top. And I said to him, are you a boxer? Yeah, I'm a retired champ, he says. Of course, he'd, he'd, he hadn't won any. Actually, he had won the Golden Glove in in in... In Australia, was it Melbourne? And but anyway, so I got his autograph that time. It was Clay at that time. It wasn't Muhammad Ali. But then he came down the stairs later, and I was looking at him. He's six foot two or three or something, and I was looking up at him, and he said, "Can I stand here?" 
so he, I was giving him permission, asking me permission, and I hear people boasting nowadays about being on the same plane as Muhammad Ali. But anyway, he he said he was kind of saying that I'm going to bring one of these back to Louisville and have a saloon on top of it and all this kind of stuff, you know. But he was very nice and polite. Uh, he was only going a couple of stops. He only wanted the experience of being on a double-decker bus. And when he was getting off, there only a couple of stops in Piccadilly up to Southampton Row, and that's where the British Museum is up there, beside that. And when he was getting out, the bus was slowing down, and he he went going backwards. He could have bloody fell over. He wasn't used to being on buses. And everyone over there would know you go with the same, you get off the bus and the moving, but you go the same direction as the bus. But I, I said, I, I, I wish you uh, well tomorrow night or look tomorrow night or something. Uh, thank you very much. And he didn't say, I don't need a ring. He was, he was a very nice person. A one-off. And I remember him. I had hundreds of passengers, but I wouldn't know who they who the, who the were. I knew him. I'd seen him the night before. And he came out with the crown. And the English didn't like that. But he, he, he was... I unquestionably the greatest athlete of the last century. I didn't know that at the time. And he used to predict the round that he'd win the fight. In round five, he was going to knock out Henry Cooper in. And he did win it in, in round five, but he'd been knocked down by Henry Cooper. Henry Cooper was a great boxer, but he used to bleed fairly easy. Now, I wouldn't be into boxing, but I'd watch Muhammad Ali's fights because they're more, more about avoiding f fights than thumping each other, for most of his fights anyway. Those two things are things worth recording. You mentioned earlier that you spend time walking in Tom Yeah. Um, would you have previously or, or even currently walked in um, upland areas or a kind of... Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I would have walked up in, in, in areas, driven up uh, and walked through because you'd be bird watching and and uh, around those times, maybe around the, f the 70s or something, the, the hen harrier used to breed even close to here and up in the hills. And you'd see, you'd, you'd see, you'd see grouse or partridges, which you wouldn't see down in the lowlands here. So I was always interested in birds. And when I, when I was in, in London, I did my bird watching in Hampstead Heat, and there was a lady there, Kate Springett. She was a retired school teacher, or maybe still school teacher, and she taught me a lot about bird calls and sounds to listen for. And it's it's, it's nearly more important to know the sounds of and the calls of birds and the songs of birds than to identify them because going through woods and all you know what's in the wood with their different calls and things and I was quite good at that eventually after years of going out in Hampstead Heath she'd keep a record of the birds in Hampstead Heath I just think there's some part of Hampstead Heath called after her still but she, she was we'd, we'd be out maybe sometimes at four o'clock in the morning you met for the dawn chorus and the birds and some of those birds like the the lesser white throat. If you didn't know the call, because they'd be in hidden in in shrub, and they were migrating or whatever. But I learned a lot from her. And within the Wicklow Mountains, then where would you kind of scale to listen to these birds and watch for them? I'd I'd I'd, I'd walk from I'd I've walked up maybe from Glen de Lock up the hill there and across the to uh, Glen Malure. and then I walked up in other places where I'd, where I'd have seen the, the hen harrier flying. But, but um, no particular place I'd be dedicated to, you know. But you'd be always hoping to see something different or hear something different. And you mentioned as well earlier on about the, maybe the depletion of insects as well in the area. Yes. 
what kind of insects would you have seen as a kid that maybe don't exist anymore? Ah, well, I, I, I wouldn't know them at that time. But the people, who, even some of the, the experts now will tell you, before, if you were driving across maybe Bogland or something like that, or coming a, a distance, when you come back to your home, you'd have to clean the windows of, of your car with all the insect blood, etc., and on the, on the number plates. Now, there's virtually no sign of it. So they're not there. I, I can't say one, sect, one insect is scarcer than another one. I can't go say that now. But in general, and and anyway, I don't think you see the swarms of insects that you that you used to see. So, how has the community of Shalala changed in your time living here? Well, we'd have an awful lot of. I don't like calling them blow-ins. <laughs> we'd have an awful lot of new people in the area now because that time everyone here they worked in Colatin. And now, well, I'm not great at knowing people anyway, but I probably wouldn't even know some of the people in the village now. Certainly not in the new houses up the way. And there's a, an awful lot of houses built up there, Colatin Gardens, and I don't know why they call them Colatin Gardens, they're nowhere near Colatin. But the Colatin Gardens or Manor Gardens, whatever, there's a lot of people moved in there and a, a lot of uh, as we know a lot of these people come uh, probably get more interest in the in the area than the people who lived here but that's not unusual what do you think the key kind of motivation or reason behind the those aspects of changing life in the area are is it you know transport is it increased technology politics you know, what do you think it, it's related to? That's a difficult one. You see, it's a, it's a beautiful area. And if transport was better, if we still had the train, for instance, to, to be easier to communicate. So, when, when the train was, came to Shillelagh, Fitzwilliam gave the land for the railway up as far as Avoca or whatever. On his land, he gave the land for the, the other. The others, they had to buy other parts of the land, the railway company. And what services still exist in Shillelagh today? And what, what kind of facilities are there? Well, there is a. a Bus and since I don't use buses now because I have a car and I I'd rarely leave the place anyway. But there is a, a bus, some local bus service, and I couldn't give you the times of the meeting because I don't have to use them. And as you get older, you don't want to be walking too far anyway when you get off these things. And how would you describe the sense of community in twenty twenty three here? Community. Mm. Uh, I think uh, I think they're pretty well organised nowadays. It wouldn't have been organised in the past. It just uh, happened. But there is a there is a, a group that look after the village and clean it and all that now, which that wouldn't have been in the past. And the. Uh, uh, organize different little events but I'm too old to take part in any of those now Is there any event maybe from your childhood that you'd love to see brought back? No, I can't think of hand You see it was basically hurling and Gaelic football, Gaelic football mostly in this area, there's very little hurling, even though the road across the way in County Wexford, uh, Kilkenny. But uh, when 
communications would be way better now, obviously. Everybody has a phone now. I used to bring groups through Colatin House. And in my young days, there were four phones in Shalala. Two of those would be belonged to Colatin. Colatin House and Colatin, uh, this, uh, this state house. And I don't know what the other ones were. But I'd bring in a group of children now and every one of them my phones going through Colatin House. So it's a and And mobile phones, they are a great asset, but they're also a, a great disaster because they're great for criminals and they're great for for people to keep their eyes off the road when they're driving. You mentioned the groups that you brought through um, Kulatin before um, and that kind of brings me to a couple of questions on tourism, I suppose, in, in the yeah. area. Um, what do you think the kind of current status or state of tourism is either in Shalala or in Wicklow more, more broadly? Oh, I'd definitely say there are more tourists nowadays because of the the transport facilities. Most of them, I suppose, would have cars and drive here. But, but uh, I would say it's much more prevalent. But uh, I don't know. What do you think some of the kind of biggest challenges of maybe you know, increased tourism in the area might be? Uh, I suppose one of the things that would annoy me is, uh, it's not going to help from tourism thing, but pollution and, and litter. It annoys me how careless we are. And even then, the other side of that, what benefits do you think the tour, increased tourism to Shalala and again the wider areas, what, what do you think that would bring? How did it bring some bit of business to shops and things like that? Definitely. You see, in my time, there were probably more shops in Shalala than there are now. And there were three pubs. There's, there's still two, but um, and see, people are much more mobile nowadays. They all have cars or some form of transport. I don't know. If couldn't, you, I couldn't help out in that. If you had a group of tourists with you, yeah, right, and let's say. You can't bring them to Kalan, right? Because yeah. you do that anyway. But if you could bring them anywhere else in either Shalala or again the broader area, where were Well, where even when I was in here now recently and there were tourists came in here, and I would recommend a place for them to visit would be Altamount Garden, which is a few miles away from here. But I think it's the nicest garden. In, I've been to Mount Osher and these places. I think that Mount. Alta Mount is, is the best in Ireland because there's a, a, a good bit of wilderness attached to it and it's, yeah, I, I would recommend that. Places to go, I don't know, you, you, okay, Glendalough's not, not too far away but it's always very, very busy. Just the bus now, going to Carlos at one o'clock, yeah. But, uh, No, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be of help in that. But I think, as I said, the thing that annoys me is litter, pollution of all kind. What do you think is the best thing about living in an upland area? In an upland area. Yeah. I suppose I, I could mention peace, <laughs> peace and freedom, but 
I can't say I'm living in an upland area. I'm in, I'm in the village of Shalala. I'm not up in the hills. But there are, it's nice to have them close at hand. If I don't go there much nowadays, obviously I'm too old. Still not too old to get around, but... And when I was young, I wouldn't have a car. We used to cycle... When they left the National School, you used to cycle to Carnew to the Technical School. That's five miles. Now they have a bus to, the, to drop them off. I don't think kids get exercise at all. If you could change one thing about Shalala, what might that be? I don't know. I can't. I can't go back to the past. I know what the future has to offer. But uh, no, I'm quite happy with Chilela as it is to to finish off my last few years. It. And um, what does it mean to you then to be from Chilela? just a place to live in peace and comfort a reasonable comfort they don't have big comforts what comforts do you want when you're over 80 years of age no I'd be, I'd be a bit dead on that one is there anything else that you'd like to add to the record that we haven't previously talked about I think of hand now. Maybe for the usual when you go off, I think of things I should have said. But no, I, I, I don't know. I've gone through my life, through my life. Very, I've taken shortcuts, obviously. But uh, no, I, I can't. I can't think much about the future. But I'd like to see the places still left in a bit of a wilderness, obviously, but that won't happen. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, I'm just going to stop the recording now.